The keyword that I explored is refuge. I approached this keyword in a variety of ways. First, I considered the work that a keyword can do for scholars. It provides a point of orientation, a rubric almost, for scholars to consider the common thread running through diverse bodies of historical narratives. It can also orient scholars towards new bodies of sources and new narratives. And I see refuge as operating in both of these fashions. Next, I consider the meanings and registers of refuge. Refuge is most commonly used in its noun form. It can be the protection from danger or distress itself, or the place that provides such protection. It can also be the condition of being protected from danger or distress. In its less commonly used verb form, it can indicate the seeking out of protection, or it can indicate the act of giving such protection. Its synonyms are sanctuary and shelter. In some instances, refuge is material. It's protection from physical danger, from tangible harm. In other cases, refuge is more existential. It can be understood as a figurative site where one finds intellectual or effective sanctuary. One can take refuge in an idea or an emotion. In this sense, refuge is often linked with belonging. Applying refuge as a keyword provides an avenue for us to consider well-known histories in fresh ways. It points to how dislocation has consistently been an engine of historical change and how displacement is a process, not a discrete event. Taking refuge as a keyword invites the following questions. What kinds of conditions motivate people to seek refuge? Through what processes have they done so? How have they obtained it? For what reasons has refuge been granted or denied? Who has the power to grant or deny it? Are violence and coercion involved in the process of granting refuge or the state of being in refuge? So taking refuge as a keyword and applying these questions draws out the ways in which refuge touches on other central concepts and topics in African history. Things ranging from ecology, to family, to ethnicity, to migration, to governance, and to the supernatural. And it provides a sharp lens through which to view social nonconformity and its consequences. Refuge in all of its senses is woven through Africa's histories. I propose that taking refuge as a keyword also opens up avenues to consider a sanctuary seeking outside the African continent. In my own work, I've used refuge as a point of orientation to consider two distinct histories. First, I've applied it to the history of opposition politics in post-colonial Kenya. In response to state violence and repression, many members of the political opposition sought refuge abroad, typically in the UK and Canada. Studying where and how these opposition figures sought sanctuary, as well as the activities they engaged in once they had found refuge, internationalizes the political history of post-colonial Kenya. Tracing the processes of seeking refuge highlights the roles played by international activist networks and humanitarian organizations in opposition politics. The archives of these organizations prevent, present a fresh body of sources for doing African history. Refuge, of course, is at the core of the term refugee. Refugee situations on the continent have been the most common way in which African scholars have approached displacement and the problems and processes of seeking refuge. Examining how Africans have sought refuge outside the continent opens up a new body of sources for the study of post-colonial Africa. Asylum records. When read ethnographically, these records depict the everyday structures and relationships that motivate people to seek refuge and they highlight the socio-cultural understandings and misunderstandings that underpin determinations about who receives refuge and who is denied. They show how new knowledge about Africa is being created and deployed outside of the continent. Overall, I would say that seeking and granting refuge and the experience of refuge itself are present throughout African history. Taking refuge as a keyword enables more thorough understandings of how displacement and dislocation have shaped Africa's histories and how they continue to drive present day realities. Hello to everyone in the ASA virtual world. My name is Julie MacArthur and I'm a professor of African history at the University of Toronto. 
And I'm thrilled to be part of the ASR's initiative around these keyword panels. It's a great opportunity to really think in interdisciplinary ways about what kinds of key ideas are circulating in and pushing our different disciplines in intersecting but also divergent ways. I want to start by explaining how I came to my keyword, which is mobility. And yes, I'm acutely aware of the irony of focusing on mobility in this time of seeming immobility for so many. But I hope that serves only to underscore even further the importance and relevance of this keyword in, in our work and in our lives and for the future of African studies. I began my research and certainly still continue a lot of my research looking at questions around territoriality, identity, and the impact of colonialism and cartography on the making of geographic imaginations. And more specifically, uh, the impact of mapping and borders on labor relations, gender relations, formulations of belonging, land conflicts, forms of resistance, uh, and claims to sovereignty, both in the colonial and post-colonial era. And so I began by looking at the way things, meaning, and people became fixed and affixed to territories, and the ways Africans themselves took up these cartographic practices for their own uses over the 20th century. And yet very early in my PhD research, uh, I came to realize that mobility, the movement of people, practices, and ideas through space was actually just as constitutive and perhaps even more so of the social and political imaginations of community. When the Luya of Western Kenya, whose collective name that was self-consciously chosen in the 1930s, it translates as, as a physical space, the, the fireplace where clan and elders gather, when they greet one another, they say mulembe, and this term asks visitors where they have been, where they are going, and entreats them to come and go in peace. And as I was told over a decade ago, anywhere they travel, quote, to be Muluya was to say Mulembe. So there's already this sense of mobility involved in, in uh, how the Luya interact in space, where, regardless of where they might be. And although we think of colonialism as a time in which identities became codified and attached to territories, there's this sense of increased fixity by boundaries and by regimes of disciplinary control, the so-called carceral landscapes, as Ashil Mbembe has talked about. During this period, we actually see the uh, increase uh, in the numbers and also the speed and scale of mobility for Africans. And this increase connects to that much deeper history and that longer history. There's almost a knee-jerk quality to the common axiom that Africans were people on the move, that Africans were always people on the move. And this has been used in a negative way, in a derogatory way in the 19th and 20th century uh, specifically, to depict a continent and a people in flux, less civilized, less sedentary, and less sophisticated because of this constant mobility. And yet, especially if you look at the literature on early population movements, innovations in technology, uh, cultural exchanges, developments in language, and a host of other fields, it is precisely that mobility that reflects the dynamism and remarkable resilience of many African communities interacting with one another and adapting to different environmental realities and historical developments. And certainly the process of globalization uh, has highlighted this even further. So mobility is not new to African studies. Migration historians have long told us that movement has always been more common among human populations, not just Africans, uh, than sedatorism. And yet naming and defining mobility uh, as a field is certainly a more recent phenomenon. In 2006, in the first issue of the journal Mobilities, Kevin Hannum, uh, Mimi Scheller and John Uri wrote that mobility had, quote, become an evocative keyword for the 21st century and a powerful discourse that creates its own effects and concepts. And this has often been termed the new mobilities paradigm. And it encompassed both large scale movements of people, objects, uh, information, and also local quotidian daily movements of people and material things uh, through the social world. And while scholars like Peter Addy have warned of the dangers of making mobility mean everything and thus nothing, the study has penetrated multiple disciplines and taken many forms, performative, affective, material, and intangible. And African Studies was there right at the beginning with the edited volume uh, Mobile Africa in 2001, arguing that mobility was a more productive and also less unidirectional framework than migration. It had more potential than the common framework of migration. Um, but even though that book came out in 2001, it was only a few years ago, there was a lot more momentum and uh, wider integration of mobility into African studies. 
Part of this delay stems precisely from debates over what exactly is moving, what constitutes or defines mobility. And there are a lot of examples we could pull uh, from here. Jedlowski has his exploration of a cargo container as a protagonist. Mavunga's uh, study of insects as agents of historical change. Delamini's recent, this year, social history of Kruger National Park uh, with its animal people and nature reserve itself all moving together. And even um, if we go back to 2000 and Louise White's vampires and the stories they inspired, along with countless other examples, all travel and complicate the ways we think about mobility within, around, and out of the continent of who's actually moving or what's actually moving. And I'm particularly excited by the new literature in environmental history. It's challenging us to think more seriously about the agency of nature. In the 1950s, when colonial officials desperately sought to shore up the northern border uh, of Kenya with Ethiopia, they ran into an unexpected, at least for the administrators, problem. The river they had used as a common border had moved. Another commission was sent out three years later. There were a lot of delays uh, uh, and problems. The border had moved again. Uh, the river had moved again, and so the border had moved again. So while human mobility remains at the center, the agency of non-human agents, from insects to ecosystems, from material containers to spiritual forces, intersects with and enlivens this inherently transnational and multidisciplinary field. In the longer piece, I go through the centrality of mobility in the long durée study of human history and the peopling of the continent, from Igor Kopitov's very influential notion of the internal African frontier, to debates over the so-called uh, Bantu migrations or expansions, uh, and even newer debates with important scholarship from Lentz, from Kleiman, from Hodgson, uh, on indigeneity and first comers discourses, hosts and stranger discourses, uh, that complicate historical claims to so-called immobile resources like land. I go through some of the different motivations and trajectories of mobility. Long distance migration, trade, seasonal or circular migrations, pastoralist and nomadic communities whose practices of mobility map spaces of kinship and heterarchical power, uh, organizations of power and sovereignty, as well as the invisible agents, mobile spirits and spirits made mobile to facilitate the migration, settlement and healthy reproduction of communities in new territories and linguistic histories by people like David Schoenbrunn and others have been particularly useful in this study. I then, as earlier mentioned, look at the impact of colonialism and particular labor migrations, gendered mobility, how men and women are able to move through spaces in different ways and with different consequences. Uh, and the new technologies uh, that are available to extend mobility, as in the auto mobility in Jennifer Hart's uh, new study on Ghana, or the multiple av new avenues and infrastructures for mobility in Walter and Kui's study of the Com in Cameroon. And we can even bring it up to more contemporary studies of mobile money, telecommunications, and new digital technologies, as we meet in this virtual space, to have created new opportunities for exploring and expanding our understanding of mobility on the continent. But I want to end by circling back to my new research and how mobility helps us to productively rethink debates over alternative decolonizations grounded in ethnic nationalisms, regional integration, and pan-Africanism that continue to inform and complicate notions of citizenship, rootedness, sovereignty, and freedom of movement on the continent. Efforts towards regional federations and the erasure of borders a uh, language that has figured so prominently in pan-Africanist discourses often faltered precisely on questions of unfettered mobility. In Africa and beyond, freedom and mobility have been deeply entwined throughout history. As African nations gained their political in independence and by and large reinforced colonial boundaries, earlier practices of mobility and translocality became increasingly criminalized or humanitarianized as new states sought to perform their newfound sovereignty, define their citizenry, and reinforce territorial nationalisms. Cross-border movements and trade became highly legislated and subject to a series of exceptions. And nowhere is this clearer, perhaps, than in refugee movements or movements that transformed people who moved through these spaces into refugees when they crossed border, the borders of new nation states. From the pioneering work of Lisa Malki in Tanzania to recent work by a range of scholars, some that has been featured in a special issue of the ASR on refugee studies just this year. And I also just saw this week that Africa as a country has started a new series on histories of refuge edited by uh, Medina Tiam. Uh, scholars have increasingly become more attuned to the voices of mobile people and the complex and diverse histories and motivations that prompted their journeys and continued 
quote unquote suspension, as Simon Turner has elaborated, between different states of a belonging. New work foc my new work focuses on uh, borderlands in Eastern Africa that both reveal the most visible and regulated forms of mobility, while also providing spaces where those displaced or on the move could and did mobilize local resources to integrate and invisibilize their ex presence. It extends into the alternative mappings of decolonization that often required highly territorialized and fixed visions of postcolonial futures. But on the ground, Africans continue to imagine and constitute these alternative communities through mobile practices and the elaboration of, quote, mobile sovereignties, alternative citizenries, and what Apadurai has called post-nationalist geographies. I want to end on a brief uh, note on methodology because it seems critical in taking this keyword from an intellectual curiosity into new fields of research. Borrowing from Julie Livingston's pre previous uh, keyword exploration, we need to approach the mobile body as method. Practically, this methodology requires not only new archives across boundaries, both political and disciplinary, but also the mobility of researchers themselves, something that has proven particularly challenging this year as I had planned to finish up my research on this new project, but can't ethically kind of push it to the next level unless I am able to, to, to get into these borderlands and, and, and be moving with people and with archives. An important caveat here is the recognition of immobilities and imbalances in these encounters as well. Researchers often have freer mobility based on status, passport, position, et cetera, in formal and informal en encounters. On the other side, mobilities deemed illicit are often by design elusive and do not require the movement of physical bodies and therefore can e evade our scholarly vision. Uh, the portability that Isabel Hoffmeyer describes in such rich detail in, the, in her uh, exploration of the Pilgrim's Progress extends to other forms, music, dance, oral literature, films, digital and social media, requiring transnational work in order to study the mobility of these multi-form stories, sounds, and sensibilities and their transformations as they move, both historically and in our present moment. Studying mobility is one way to break away from the methodological nationalism and immobilizing tendencies of categorizations inherited from colonialism that still continue to dominate a lot of African studies. Centering mobility further unsettles the illusory borders of modern nation states, challenges notions of belonging and rootedness, and forces us as scholars to move along, both physically and intellectually, with the people, places, and the spirits uh, that we study. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to getting the chance to receive your feedback and to see everyone again soon. The keyword in African studies that I'd like to talk about today is youth. I'm gonna start this presentation with what is at this point a well-worn trope. That is to say that Africa is youthful. Statistics that suggest an overwhelming youth bulge are both plentifully available and enduring. In 2015, the UN reported 226 million youth aged 15 through 24 on the continent, representing 20% of Africa's population. If we expand the definition to include those aged 0 through 35, it increases the share of Africa's population to 75%. Projections that warn policymakers in the same breath in health, education, and civil society of a rapidly increasing bulge and anticipate that the number of youth in Africa will double by 2055. Now, as a young historian and a former international development worker, I'm interested in what these numbers say about African young people, but also what they're telling us about youth. Even in this short demographic snapshot, the neat categorizations of age classifications fluctuate, sometimes 15 through 24, other times 0 through 35. From these demographics, we can see an enduring narrative, not simply about the growth in the number of young people, but about the potentials and the crises of the African continent. As Deborah Durham suggests, the act of identifying youth by necessity creates these discourses about power and authority. Here, if the power of youth can be harnessed, opportunity abounds, political dynamacy, cultural change, increasing education and economic production, global consumption, etc. The opportunity side exists simultaneously with the implication of a ticking time bomb. A youth population barreling out of control represents a continent in crisis. 
In this way, it seems we're not much farther away in our popular narratives of African youth than in the 1990s when uh, political writer Robert Kaplan infamously conceived the coming anarchy in which he describes young Af West African men as, quote, loose molecules in a very unstable social fluid, a fluid on the verge of igniting. In Kaplan's statement, I think, is a conflation of anxieties that is often embedded in these types of discussions about youth, that is, African youth and a youthful Africa. It is not only African young people, um, but the continent itself that simmers in a state of unfinished and unpredictable maturation. In this way, African youth inhabit a space between demographic fact and metaphor. Acknowledging, Africa, acknowledging youth as a keyword for the study of Africa both recognizes the term's rhetorical power as well as its significance as a node of identity in mobilizing social and political movements. While youth is an important concept in the study of Africa begins with the early to mid 20th century anthropological studies of generation and initiation. It's in the 80s and 90s that, we, that the study of African youth becomes even more pressing. Um, at this time, the continent is feeling the effects of World Bank and IMF structural adjustment policies, which lead to financial pressures and political upheaval. Youth population become the study of, on one hand, uh, resistance and social organizing, cultural production, uh, and globalization, and on the other hand, violent conflict, socioeconomic marginalization, migration, public health crises, etc. Inherent in this line of scholarship was the recognition between young people and rapid social change. But it also reveals the inadequacy of the analytic of youth to point to specific social, economic, political, and cultural dynamics. In this scholarship, youth are simultaneously recognized as citizens and outside of citizenry, as participating in markets and excluded from them, as shapers of change and also shaped by it. With such a wide range of youthful phenomena, Burton, Andrew Burton and Sh Helen Sharton Bigot's description of youth as a, quote, catch-all existential category that encompasses all subaltern despairs and desires seems rather apt. As a historian of Africa, I often think if defining youth is a tricky endeavor, then what's the value of continuing to use it as an analytic um, as well as a topic of study in African past and present? Ultimately, to me, it seems that to seek a simple bounded definition of youth is, an, is a task that will end in frustration. Um, to define youth points to the limitations of the category. But it's arguably this indefinability that makes the category so interesting. The various productions and deployments of the term youth at different moments in time and across space speak to the way that power is both organized and subverted among groups of people. It reveals the multiplicity of the ways that societies drive and respond to cultural, social, and economic change. My own work is interested in the identification and treatment of youth and child populations in 20th century colonial Africa. Richard Waller has, and other scholars have suggested that colonial authorities were preoccupied with the actions of young people and had an ambivalent and anxious relationship with youth populations. At some point, youth represented the African subject who was malleable, whose maturation was not yet complete and who therefore existed in a state of possibility. For this reason, efforts to transform young people into productive adults were an important part of the colonial project. For colonial officials, schools were a site of this controlled future making. Um, while students in British colonies may have experienced uh, education emphasizing vernacular knowledge in the service of indirect rule, students in French colonies may have learned French curricula and culture as part of an ideology that was often assimilatory. Alternately, mission education provided young people with the literacy and moral training that would encourage Christian notions of cultural and family life. In the Catholic missions of coastal French West Africa that I study, 
raising children in the Catholic faith was at the heart of the work done in orphanages and schools. Missionaries recognized that the, fu the future of youth was tenuous and that the adolescence period was a critical time in which faith could be indoctrinated and preserved. In the mission orphanages of Senegal, abandoned young African and mixed race girls were kept within the orphanage until their early 20s, not only to save them from material deprivation, but in order to be isolated from the threatening urban culture and Muslim traditions and to, during their formative years and until they could be married. So in this way, both missionaries and uh, colonial education officials recognized that adolescence was a critical time in which African children could be wholly transformed into civilized adults through the indoctrination of colonizers' notions of time, hygiene, and consumption. Armed with the theories of childhood and adolescent development of the early 20th century, colonial education was therefore a site of identifying shaping and limiting the ambitions and futures of African youth. So if one side of the coin portrayed African youth as the future of the empire, then the other indicated that they were defiant and dangerous sources that could both unsettle and uh, unsettle both established African and imperial forms of authority. The identification therefore of delinquent youth was and still is in some ways an expression of state anxieties about unchecked physicality, sexuality, and masculinities. Now, these tropes are clearly not just a colonial phenomenon. Like re colonial regimes, international agencies, national governments, development programs, and even scholars remain invested in this dual youth representation. In the literature, we see that youth are both makers and breakers, vanguards and vandals, heroes and villains, etc. But I think it's important to remember that there's life between this bifurcation. As scholars, we have work to do to understand the ways that youth takes on more meanings outside of the rhetoric and boundaries of a discordant metaphor. The value of tracing the trajectories of the concept of youth lie in the fact that youth is not simply discourse, but it's a compelling identity and force for change for millions of young people around the world. As a historian of Africa, I think it's important to consider how and why youth identities are claimed in different ways at different times. Scholars must continue to grapple with the complexities of studying youth because to organize under the banner of youth or to be recognized under it is deeply meaningful to young people themselves. In 2020, in the midst of the escalating violence, challenged by uh, Black Lives Matter, the End SARS movement, et cetera, we're reminded of the power of youth more than ever. Police brutality, state and uh, corporate exploitation and gender-based violence has been brought to the fore by young people who are mobilizing in a quintessential, quintessentially youthful method that is social media. Their imagination, courage, and resilience underscores to, that to consider oneself or to be considered youth is not simply to be stuck in liminality, but to be a part of a community, to a subvert established forms of authority, to be a global consumer, and to dream about different ways of living and shaping the world. To claim youth status, therefore, is to engage with the past while looking for new ways to be in the future. Thank you. My name is Christopher Omar. I'm an associate professor in the English department at the University of Cape Town. And my paper is titled Pan-Africanism, keyword Pan-Africanism. This paper is part of a bigger project that I'm working on at the moment uh, that looks at small magazines, which are part of the broader sort of print cultures in Africa and how small magazines contributed to Pan-African imagination uh, in mid-century Africa, between 1955 and 1975. This is immediately after the Second World War, um, a period of high nationalism, decolonization, civil rights, anti-apartheid activism. And I'm looking at the ways in which small magazines uh, brought all of these things together and created conditions for their intersection 
and the movement of ideas within those spaces of the magazine and the cultural organizations that uh, uh, printed those magazines, the movement of people and ideas around a sort of pan-African identity in relation to these issues. So how does one think about pan-Africanism as a key word in relation to that? I suppose one could begin by looking at the more contemporary scene and looking at how popular music, popular forms of cultural production in recent times have brought back the issue of pan-African solidarity, pan-African cultural practice. Um, you could think about how a number of Hollywood actors and musicians and rappers have recently acquired various forms of African citizenship, whether you're talking about rapper Christopher Brand Bridges um, acquiring Gabonese citizenship, or more recently, Samuel L. Jackson acquiring Gabonese citizenship, uh, having gone through uh, the PBS docuseries Finding Your Roots, um, you begin to see that popular cultural imagination is bringing back uh, in the last 10 years um, uh, a sort of sense of what we mean by pan-Africanism in, in these millennial times. Whether you're also thinking about the various forms of collaborations amongst musicians um, in the continent, within the continent and in the, in the diaspora, whether it's, you know, um, Beyonce's latest uh, um, musical film um, uh, where she's doing collaborations with African artists or whether you're thinking about various African artists who uh, either signing up in American music labels, whether it's Nasty C in South Africa, signing with Def Jam Records or a whole range of other musicians, working with um, African-American musicians, uh, musicians from um, the continent. So the contemporary moment, the millennial moment, and the production of popular culture continues to remind us that uh, Pan-Africanism, its forms of cultural practice, this kind of imagination, uh, continues to prevail, uh, has a long um, genealogy um, that one can trace back across the, the 20th century and, and back even further. And so in the paper, I try to, to look at um, these genealogies and I begin with the, the notion of return. How, does, how can we think about return, the idea of return, the idea, the imagination, the experience of return as um, invoking um, this genealogy of Pan-Africanism, whether it's, as I pointed out, various you know, artists and, and, and cultural producers coming to the continent, working with artists in the continent, or whether it's, in the case of Ghana, the, the official project of, an, of the Ghanaian government to um, set out 2019 as a year of return and, and have a number of you know, diasporans, people from the New World, come to Ghana um, for that year to commemorate uh, that important year, 400 years after um, the first group of slaves landed in, in Jamestown, Virginia. So when you think about the question of return, then you can begin to trace the genealogies of Pan-Africanism. And so I, I, I try to uh, examine how the question of return um, plays itself out in, in various forms of popular culture production, whether you're thinking about coming to America um, with, the, with the character Kim, uh, or whether you're thinking about Black Panther. Um, and, and these two films are sort of uh, one in the, you know, in the late 20th century and the other one in, the, in this new millennium are sort of you know, reminding us um, of this imagination and, and the question of return. But again, one cannot, one cannot trace the genealogies of Pan-Africanism without obviously going back to the more significant historical aspect uh, in relation to return. So the establishment of Liberia, the establishment of Sierra Leone, which go back to 19th century attempts by the American Colonization Society um, and, of course, the, the British abolitionist movement in the 18th century. So going all the way back and thinking about these two nation states as invoking that long and deep history of return and, 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 para and perhaps the beginnings of um, the idea of Africa in the diaspora. Uh, so, so it's important to dig even further back and look at what, what that means. And when you think about scholars like um, C.L.R. James, who um, was writing within the context of the interwar um, when he wrote The Black Jacobins, you can see the way that The Black Jacobins is a text that reminds us of um, the connections between slavery, slavery as a moment in which the idea of Africa is violently uh, thought about and conceptualized through the bodies of the slaves, uh, 
and the emergence of anti-colonial movements in, in the early 20th century and therefore forecasting a future post-colonial society in Africa that could be modeled after Haiti. So in other words, you have someone like C.L.R. James, whose work uh, continues to remind us of these deeper genealogies of Pan-African thinking, Pan-African imagination, Pan-African intellectual work. Or someone like um, um, Cedric Robinson's, um, uh, you know, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, which goes back to the Maroon communities in, in 15th century Mexico and telling us that those were perhaps the first independent republics that had a strong connection to Africa, culturally, politically, and in, and in other ways. So in other words, it's, you know, um, you know, one cannot think about Pan-Africanism just in relation to uh, W.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey and the Congresses that uh, were dominant in the, in the 1920s without thinking about um, previous centuries and the idea of Africa, the question of return, um, the, um, you know, how, how those earlier moments that were sort of overdetermined by the experience of slavery were themselves uh, crucial moments for thinking about Africa. Uh, the scholar Akim Hadi has argued that uh, um, Otoba Kuguano and um, uh, Olado Equiano uh, are per perhaps precursors of people who embody a sort of Pan-Africanist imagination and Pan-Africanist sentiment. And in fact, Kuguano's setting up of um, the organization Sons of Africa, Akim Adi reads that as, um, um, as quite preeminently the precursor to Pan-Africanism as a movement. So you have these genealogies that go way back and one has to make connections uh, with slavery, uh, with movements that, that try to abolish slavery, um, the abolitionist movements, with the, the question of return that then puts Africa on the map of um, the political economy of the diaspora. But, but what really, really consolidated Pan-Africanism uh, and its imagination, uh, particularly in the 20th century, uh, were various print cultures. Um, and small magazines have occupied a central, um, a central place in the imagination of Pan-Africanism, the movement of ideas between the continent and other continents, the sort of transcontinental, transnational movement of this idea of Pan-Africanism and its imagination. And so whether you're thinking about the beginning of Harlem Renaissance, um, sorry, Harlem Renaissance, or uh, and the setting up of a magazine like The Crisis uh, in 1909, um, you know, on the back of the, the national, you know, the NAACP and how The Crisis uh, was really trying to create an imagination that would connect, um, you know, post-reconstruction uh, America and movements of anti-colonialism uh, in Europe, connecting African-American work with black Europeans, um, a very, very important magazine in that regard. Um, and whether you're thinking about uh, a magazine much later called Pan-Africa that was set up by the International African Service Bureau on the back of, you know, the movements that mobilize against the Italian invasion of, of Ethiopia uh, at, at a time when, um, you know, diaspora Africans from West, the West Indies, African, you know, from, from North America and from the continent congregated in, in various capitals in Europe and try to um, make connections between their fight for anti-colonialism, for civil rights, and against anti-fascism, and trying to kind of uh, create the conditions that then lead to uh, the moment of decolonization after the Second World War. So you have a magazine that, like Pan-Africa, which was set up by the International African Service Bureau, that tries to do uh, a lot of the work of embodying Pan-African imagination um, immediately after the Second World War going off the back of the last Congress in 1945 and returning the, um, the idea of Pan-Africanism to the continent. And whether you're thinking about mid-century magazines in the continent like um, Transition, Black Office, Lotus, The Classic, these were crucial magazines that, that consolidated Pan-African imagination in the continent and that then brought all of these intersections, uh, civil rights, uh, anti-colonialism, uh, anti-apartheid activism uh, into the continent and made visible Pan-African cities like Accra uh, in Ghana, Lagos in Nigeria, Nairobi in Kenya, and Kampala uh, in, uh, in Uganda as the cities of continental Pan-African imagination.
So these magazines are quite central to that period. And when you fast forward to the contemporary moment, uh, you're thinking about magazines like Kwani in Nairobi, um, Chimrenga in, in, in South Africa and Cape Town, uh, or even Farafina in Nigeria and a host of other magazines that continue to deploy, to assemble various practices of, of, of solidarity across the continent and around the world. Um, and so what basically the argument I'm making is that small magazines have been uh, a central part of the genealogies of Pan-Africanism. Um, and perhaps you could ascribe small magazines and the role that they've played in Pan-Africanist thinking and imagination to what uh, George Shepperson in his crucial article in the 60s, uh, where he makes a distinction between Pan-Africanism with, with a capital P, which references the Pan-Africanist Congresses that were held by W. B. Du Bois in the 1920s, and Pan-Africanism with a small p, which uh, means, uh, um, in the way that George Shepperson was looking at it, uh, the more diffuse, more ephemeral uh, movements of Pan-Africanism that, that were scattered around the world um, and that were organized in different parts of the world without any sort of coherent project as um, W.B. Du Bois's congresses. And I, I suppose small magazines sort of follow in that spirit. They're ephemeral, they continue to do the work outside of the, um, outside of, of the, the so, sort of normative platforms of, of collective identity like the nation state. They remain very evasive of those categories and they remain evasive of an overdetermining logic of the national state, particularly uh, in the continent. So small magazines could be seen in that regard. So in the paper, I, I, I simply just conclude um, by saying that small magazines have therefore played a central role in creating conditions for Pan-Africanist imagination to flourish. They have been a consistent platform from which is reflected the movement of people and ideas, the articulation and translation of various grammars of blackness or Africanness, and the intersection of global black struggles from which the concept and idea of Pan-Africanism has found an expressive home in the long 20th century. I thank you for your time. Hi, um, my name is Claudia Gastro. I'm the discussant for this African Studies Review sponsored panel on keywords. As you would know if you've chosen to log into this session, this panel deals with um, keywords for the field of African studies. And each of the presenters in this panel has already provided in their larger papers, very comprehensive genealogies and discussions of the keywords they've chosen for this panel, youth, mobility, Pan-Africanism, and refuge, um, as well as bringing these terms to bear on their own current research. And it's really been an exciting experience to be a discussant for a panel like this, because it it really expands your knowledge of kind of really central areas of research for the field. And so without much ado, I'm going to move on to the actual discussion of the papers. And I hope, you, hope my discussion is helpful for both the presenters and those who are watching. And so Abby Warchols, her key term, her key word was youth. And in the larger paper, she really comprehensively covers much of the existing work about the term, as well as the debates that have arisen from it. She emphasizes the extremely contested nature of the term in that who, asking who counts as youth um, and most importantly, focusing on the fact that this is really a constantly shifting demographic, making the term highly historical and contextual. Even more important, she really explicitly emphasized the fact that there's not one def definition of the term, but rather its significance comes from the ways in which it is mobilized by actors on the ground for political, policy, economic, or other purposes. The paper picks up on key themes such as weighthood and life course, for instance. Two things stood out to me, and I think it would be interesting for her to push them further. The first is the, is the extent to which, as she argues, the constant glassing of the African continent is youthful, makes it seem to, in her words, quote, simmer in an unfinished and unpredictable maturation. For me, this phrase was so powerful because it precisely captures the relationship between visions of the continent as dark, backwards, lacking development, but also seeing it as a place for extraction, speculation, of, and profit, of futures, that is. So both a continent that is very often perceived in kind of stereotyped or negative ways as un undeveloped, as backward, as kind of located in the past, but also as a space of the ultimate promise of the future for capital. And it's precisely these tensions, this tension of being past and future, um, which also very often captures the description or the understanding of youth, as youth of dangerous and yet full of promise, for instance. And it's this tension which she highlights 
at the end of the larger paper, and which I suggest makes, in fact, and she suggests, politicians, institutions, etc., interested in the category of the youth, as they hope that it's possible to capture this potential of youth, the potential youth, the potential future, right, in, in kind of mobilizing youth and engaging with youth, whoever counts as youth, which is, of course, is always at the center of, of the debate. I think, however, the author could push this tension even further. Um, and I'd really just, this is more a comment than a question, but I'd really just see, like to see how much she could push it in order to kind of refract representations of the continent through the question of youth and vice versa. Finally, another thing I'd like to push this author on is really um, the question of, of class. She, in the larger paper, she already raised the central question of gender, and it would be wonderful to see this filled out more. As in my experience, especially when it comes to questions of political mobilization, um, youth almost exclusively is actually being used to refer to young men. Where young women fit in these kind of scenarios um, and categorization is fascinating. I think it's more generally, from what I've seen in the literature or kind of policy circles, young women are more often seen as kind of um, good recipients for microcredit or kind of economic investment. And it's interesting to think about how those kind of gender divisions come about. Um, and so I, I would just like to see that filled out in the paper more because I think it's really key for thinking about the more obvious categorizations of youth, which very often appear in the public, which are very masculine, and then the kind of more technocratic policy discussions of youth, which very often I think seem to fall into questions about young women and kind of their futures. Um, I know Jennifer Cole, among others, has worked on this question, and it might be worth taking a look at her work. However, as I said, what I think what I think might be missing from this paper is really an investigation of class. And what made me think of this was thinking back to Atto Quayson's uh, book, Oxford Street, where he has a chapter on bodybuilding, immediately following a chapter on salsa dancing. And what's striking in the kind of juxtaposition of these two of these two chapters is they're both focusing on young people. But the salsa dancers are generally, not always, but generally slightly wealthier, slightly more means than these bodybuilders, who are almost exclusively men. And both of these chapters, in a way, deal with the question of what one does with extra time. But what becomes abundantly clear is if one has more money, more wealth, your extra time becomes leisure. Whereas for those young men who are really in the very poorest neighborhoods, their extra time is characterized as waiting. And so I'm just wondering if we're using these categories like weighthood, um, sort of looking at potentiality, um, what happens when we start to see youth as kind of a classed category? Are wealthy youth a category that we really, anthropologists at least, or historians, have really written about extensively? Um, if we're thinking of the crisis of youth, the question of youth being around young people unable to fill their life course, or unable to be gainfully employed. Um, these are not things which would generally apply the same to different class categories or at least different income levels. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we can think about what the category of youth means when we start dealing with different levels of income and access within the continent. The next keyword to which I move is mobility by Julie MacArthur. And Julie Reddy brilliantly provides the reader with an overview of key debates in African studies to highlight how the question of ability has actually been central to the field even before it kind of emerged as a named central concept. And she therefore kind of takes us, she tells us, you know, we can think about debates over the early migrations of people, over urban rural relations, and colonial controls of movement. And looking back, we could really reconfigure these within a debate about mobility. Mobility, of course, as she points out, is also not limited to people, but to um, ideas, to objects, to music. So she really engages a very broad, broad spectrum of what kind of mobility could entail. So I really do find the paper extremely comprehensive, um, but I'd like to push the author on two issues. The first is kind of just a question that came up for me, which is really about scale. So in the paper, um, there's a lot of discussion, if you want, of different scales of mobility, the sort of local level mobility, um, intra-African mobility, um, transnational mobility, mobility between states, mobility between um, rural and urban. And 
all of this suggests that there's that scale is in fact a key issue when we're considering how we classify mobility or how we can even identify what is what is moving. It seems as we jump scale, we may lose or elide the mobility of certain actors in favor of kind of looking at other categories. And so I'm just wondering, um, I just like to push Julie a bit on thinking about what would happen to kind of the category of mobility if you explicitly analyze scale or insert scale as a category that intersects with it um, and, and, and what happens then to how one understands mobility or how one approaches it um, as a methodology even. Secondly, I want to push Julie further just on a claim about mobility decentering the nation state. So on the one hand, I, when I read that, I was like, of course, if you're focusing on mobile bodies, then you're not focusing on kind of the static borders of the nation. Um, but then at the same time, it seemed to me that a lot of the examples that were being used actually recenter, have a logic which recenters the nation state, because the state and borders, the minute one's dealing with kind of moving objects, moving people, at least, moving people and objects, maybe ideas are easier to transmit, um, one comes again, up against the problem of the border. And so there, there seems to be a really sticky relationship between the nation state and the possibility of conceptualizing mobility um, once at least post-independence and probably even pre-independence, um, given colonial controls over movements of Africans in the continent. And so in some ways, I wonder, is, does the analytic of mobility not occasionally, um, or could it not potentially at times, if we're trying to think of intra-African mobility, especially between countries, kind of recenter nation-state logics, perhaps not the analytic, but the following of people might force one to have to deal with the nation state constantly. So it's not really clear that it automatically leads to a decentering of the nation state in one's analysis. It may in fact force one to really think through the nation state as a category because you would always be running up against it in certain ways. Uh, the next keyword is presented by Christopher Omar, who presents um, Pan-Africanism, which is a really timely term to investigate due to, as he shows, a renewed interest in black internationalism and the strong embrace of shared popular imaginations of blackness on the continent and in the diaspora, seen most recently in such major productions as Black Panther and Beyonce's Black is King. So Christopher provides a genealogy of Pan-Africanism as a formal political movement from its birth in the diaspora to its embrace on the continent, most famously in the figure of Kwame Nkrumah. Importantly, and I found this really helpful, he draws on George Shepson's distinction between Pan-Africanism with a big P and a formal movement of intellectuals, politicians, congresses, and associated pu publications, and what Shepson refers to as Pan-Africanisms with a small p, um, the more everyday ephemeral ways in which black solidarity and relationships were imagined and mobilized and still are. And it's focusing on the latter pan-Africanism that Christopher is then able to begin to examine how his focus, small magazines on the continent, produced and continue to produce new imaginations of pan-Africanisms that, whilst drawing on established traditions from the diaspora, insert new continental-based concerns and interests into the conversation. And it's really predominantly on this, on this kind of latter category of pan-Africanisms, and especially the continental-based pan-Africanisms, um, that I'm interested in hearing about more in this paper. Um, I'd like Christopher, if it were possible, <laughs> to elaborate a bit more on how kind of these small Pan-Africanisms, the content of them changed over time and space. Um, the early examples of them are kind of Garveyanism, Ethiopianism, but what happens as we move through time? How do those kind of, how do those continue to influence, but, but what changes? And then also what new conversations do writers scholars, um, everyday people on, on the continent bring to this discussion that has been over time emanating from the diaspora but then comes to the continent in kind of very interesting and important ways. Um, I'd like to know what these kind of continental magazines, how they differ or intersect with more established traditions of Pan-Africanism with a big P, um, and what this can tell us about conceptualizing the genealogy of the term, what needs to be reconceptualized once we bring in kind of this ephemera of small magazines of everyday people um, that are kind of moving outside of these sort of large movements of congresses, of the found, founding of the Organization of African Unity, kind of these large political moments or figures. How, how does that redraw Pan-Africanism in the 20th century? 
And finally, Catherine Luongo takes us into the theme of refuge, um, a really important keyword, providing us an overview, kind of at first, of various kinds of refuge that have existed on the continent and specifically in Kenya's history, and asking us how we might, for instance, be able to reimagine key events in history if we chose to think of them through the category of refuge rather than violence or displacement. Because as she points out, once you start to focus not just on the act of displacement or the act of violence that leads to displacement, but also the, the granting of refuge, who's able to grant, and who seeks refuge, where they seek refuge, from whom they seek refuge, you start to kind of pull out more complicated social relationships that just focusing on displacement or violence or exclusion may elide. And my question for Catherine actually, again, focuses on class relations of a very similar nature to what I challenged uh, Abby on in the first, kind of, when discussing the first key term. And it strikes me that most of the ways in which you've been conceptualizing refuge really have to do with these quite violent processes of exclusion or displacement, um, even as you make a case, and a very strong case, for following through a whole process. So not just looking at the moment through which one moves, but the process through which one gains refuge, what that says about power relations, what that says about social relationships, which I think is so important. However, and this is just more of an interest factor, I guess, we also know that the term is used in more lighthearted ways. So people might say they are going, their holidays give them refuge from their work or um, forms of self-care being a refuge. And I'm just interested, given that, I mean, I, I know it's kind of overhyped in some sense, but given that there has been um, although post COVID this may not may not may not during COVID or post COVID this may not may no longer be the case. But for a good chunk of the first two decades of the two thousands, there was a notable growth in what we might call a middle class, or if we're not happy with that term, at least a growth of people with disposable income in many African countries. Um, is it possible to kind of think of refuge in terms of studies of consumption, of leisure, and not just in these larger political processes? What happens to the term? when we kind of move it away from these kind of very extravagant kind of forms of refuge seeking um, to more sort of everyday understandings, how, how can it shed light on those kinds of processes? So I hope these questions have been helpful for the authors and the, well, also presenters, same thing in this case. Um, and hopefully at some point it will be possible to meet both the presenters and whoever is watching this video in person. Thank you for joining us.